Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. We're going to continue our discussion of the skeletal system. In prior videos, we learned how bones are formed in the embryo by means of intramembranous and endochondral ossification. Then we focused on how bones grow in children, and we particularly uh, looked at the, the different phases or processes that the cartilage cells go through at the epiphysial plate, a process we call interstitial growth or um, longitudinal bone growth, which typically goes along with more appositional bone growth. Here we're going to take a look at what happens to our skeletal system once those epiphysial plates are closed and Essentially, we could say our skeletal system or our bones have reached adulthood. And the main um, process that occurs when we are adults is referred to as bone remodeling. Bone remodeling actually consists of two separate processes itself. And you are pretty familiar with these processes already. So let's take a look at these. In adult bones, bone remodeling occurs. And bone remodeling consists of bone deposits, which you all know is done by our osteoblasts who secrete osteoid, and bone resorption, or you could say bone reabsorption, meaning the osteoclasts digest the bone tissue, which you were aware of as well. Bone remodeling is always happening and I say here it accompanies bone growth in children, but really we saw it happening in the fetus as well. As, as in any time we're making bone tissue, we need our osteoblasts and especially our osteoclasts to also shape the bone tissue. Uh, whether it's to add bone markings, especially in children's bones, or perhaps to shape the trabeculae that are just barely beginning to form in the fetus. But bone remodeling with bone deposit and bone resorption, those are the only two processes we see happening in adults. So no more bone lengthening and no more the making of bone tissue um, from a, a cartilaginous structure or mesenchyme cells uh, with fibers in between in adults. Let's first focus on bone deposit. And where would it occur first of all? Well, in adult bones, we're going to see that bone deposit needs to occur in areas where there is an injury. Let's say you break a bone. That bone needs to heal. Clearly, more bone tissue needs to be produced. So at injury sites, oops, I'm sorry. Let's uh, fix that slide here real quick. And then also, we're going to see bone deposit occurring at sites where more strength is needed. In other words, if you tomorrow start working out daily at the gym with heavy weights, your muscles are going to hypertrophy and that consequently is going to put enough stress on our bones to where they are going to be triggered to grow stronger and thicker uh, as well. Now exactly how that trigger works is not very clear, by the way. Um, we're still not totally understanding how exactly our bones know, hey, it's time to start making more bone tissue. We do know that there are all kinds of ingredients needed in order to make bone tissue, and we will look at what a proper diet um, uh, entails in just a little while, but there definitely is a, an important enzyme called alkaline phosphatase that must be present in enough quantities in order for our bone tissue to mineralize, in order for that osteoid that the uh, osteoblasts uh, secrete, uh, for that to be able to mineralize. Now what's interesting is when bone deposit occurs, and again, bone deposit is basically going to very often be in the form of appositional bone growth. So we have in many ways already looked at this. And I maybe should not call it bone growth right now. Maybe we could call it appositional bone deposit. So if this is our long bone, 
I'm just going to sketch this real quick with the periosteum around it or around the, most of the diaphysis and part of the epiphyses. Remember that the osteoblasts can start secreting bone tissue onto the existing diaphysis in this direction. And that we have been calling appositional bone growth or appositional um, bone deposit. Bear in mind though that at times it might happen that if we um, if we it might happen that we need to add some bone tissue from the medullary cavity it's possible that that endosteum might at times need to add some bone tissue it needs to be reshaped it might have to um, it might be that the medullary cavity needs to uh, be bigger on one side smaller on the other side things like that so just use your imagination and, and proper reasoning a little bit in order to better understand where we might need to add bone tissue uh, in adult bone. Now the point I'm going to get at here next is this right here. Where we see new bone matrix deposited, which of course initially starts with osteoid, what's interesting is that first there is this, the, 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 the osteoid that is secreted by the osteoblast is going to sit there, kind of like a band of osteoid, better referred to as the osteoid seam. So remember, osteoid is just unmineralized bone matrix. So it sits over here for a little while, and then suddenly, especially with the help of this enzyme, alkaline phosphatase, it'll become mineralized. It happens rather fast once the mineralization occurs. It's not a very gradual process. So therefore, we see the seam sitting there, this osteoid seam, and and then immediately it, it, there's an abrupt change to our still existing compact bone tissue, sometimes referred to as the calcification front. The other process that is part of bone remodeling we call bone re reabsorption or easier res resorption. And of course that includes or involves your osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are these big multinucleated cells that secrete enzymes, lysozymal enzymes, which are going to take care of digesting organic um, materials in the matrix, particularly the collagen fibers. So maybe we should uh, remind you that this is going to be your collagen fibers, especially as well as some of the organic ground substance such as your proteoglycans, for instance. At the same time, we see that the osteoclasts also produce acids, especially hydrochloric acids, and they're going to take apart the hydroxy apatites. Remember, those are your calcium phosphate crystals, such that you end up with individual calcium ions and individual phosphate ions, and they will eventually be able to enter into the bloodstream. So they diffuse into the bloodstream eventually. We also have our cells, our osteocytes that need to be taken care of and the osteoclasts can phagocytize those osteocytes. Interestingly enough, our osteoclasts commit suicide by means of apoptosis when they have gone through these various processes that involve bone or that sum up bone resorption. Now why such emphasis on calcium? What's the big deal about calcium? Well for one you will see that once once we move on to the muscular system and after that the nervous system we talk calcium non-stop. Calcium is a very important ion for muscle contraction it's a very important ion for nerve cells, or also called neurons, to be able to essentially create these electrical currents. That's just how we will refer to it for now, and to pass on the electrical currents. Calcium ions are also going to play a role in, in, in blood clotting. As a matter of fact, it is one of our blood clotting factors. 
it plays a role in mitotic divisions. It plays a role in the secretion of materials by glands. And unfortunately, um, well, actually, this is correct. The secretion by nerve cells, and by that we mean the secretion of neurotransmitters. The list is endless. This is just a, an actually a rather short list. So through time, you're going to see how important a role calcium ions play. Your heart, for instance, cannot function without proper levels of calcium. Now, when we studied bone growth in children, we said that that process, that is bone growth, is mostly regulated by hormones. The most important hormone being growth hormone. And then as puberty hits, we need to add to that also estrogen and testosterone. When we talk bone remodeling in adults, we, we once again see that certain hormones play a role to regulate calcium levels, but mechanical stress plays a very important role um, in bone remodeling in adults. So let's take a closer look at this for just a moment. So mechanical stress determines where bone remodeling occurs in a uh, adult bone. And I, I'm just giving you some examples of pictures. You don't really have to know this terminology here. This is just a picture that doesn't have any copyrights, um, so I managed to grab it. But you can see that there is different ways in which the head of this femur is getting remodeled and more than likely this has to do with the kinds of stresses that this particular femur is experiencing. Possibly there was a fracture that didn't heal right and consequently the head began to drop more horizontally. But if you, like I said earlier, start to work out or you begin to you start a job that requires a lot more arm movements, you're going to see that the muscles in your arms are going to build up and that's going to put some mechanical forces onto your bones and somehow that triggers bone deposits uh, along with bone resorption, in other words, bone remodeling. And this fo follows a law referred to as Wool's Law. So be sure that you're familiar with the fact that mechanical stress follows Wool's Law. Gravitation also plays a role in Wool's Law because gravity actually is a, is a type of mechanical stress. And we see this happening in astro astronauts who are, who've been out in space for a long time, or even people who have been bedridden. If there hasn't been enough gravitational force onto our skeletal system, we're going to see that our bones begin to atrophy. In other words, they grow thinner. Our muscles grow thinner and consequently our bones will grow thinner. Our body is never going to hold on to tissues it doesn't really need, or I should say tissue sizes that it doesn't really need. There's no point in you having a huge gigantic biceps brachii if you're really not having a need to lift up very heavy things with your forearms all the time. So that's mechanical stress. Let's Bone remodeling also depends on hormones. And these are hormones that are going to be released depending on the amount of calcium in our blood. Remember, calcium levels in our blood play a very important role in the body because we must always have certain amounts of calcium to be able to contract our muscles, make our neurons work, go through cellular divisions, etc., etc., blood clotting. Uh, we've listed those things before. And so, depending on whether our calcium levels are rising or dropping in our blood, we will see different hormones being released. So, Hormonal mechanisms are going to determine when, when bone remodeling occurs in the body. The two hormones that play a very important role in ensuring that calcium levels in the blood maintain homeostatic levels are parathyroid hormone, often abbreviated PTH. This is a hormone secreted by your parathyroid glands. And then calcitonin. 
this is another hormone that is secreted by the thyroid gland. So your thyroid gland secretes not only thyroid hormone, but also calcitonin. Of these two, parathyroid hormone plays the most important role. Calcin calcitonin plays less of a, a role, particularly in adults. Calcitonin is more important in bone remodeling in um, children. Remember, bone remodeling really occurs throughout life, but it's the only process that occurs in bones that have stopped growing. Let's say a few words about parathyroid hormone and then um, the way calcitonin works will make a lot of sense as well. Parathyroid hormone, by the way, as the name says, is secreted by the parathyroid glands. And these are little glands that we typically find on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. So if Remember, the thyroid is located sort of in your throat area. It has these two big fleshy lobes. Let's imagine that we could rip off our thyroid and hold it in our hands and look at it from the back. There we would usually find four little uh, glands embedded onto the back of the thyroid gland, and those are the parathyroid glands. We often find them distributed throughout our chests a little bit as well. So how does this work? Uh, hormone function. So let's come to our graph here and this horizontal bar indicates that calcium levels in the blood are within homeostasis and not that you have to know these numbers but um, there should be about 10 milligrams per deciliter of blood of calcium. Now let's say that the um, calcium levels in the blood begin to drop. If they begin to drop, so meaning that this bar is going to drop in this direction, or you can see what it says here, decreased calcium levels, the parathyroid glands are going to be stimulated to release parathyroid hormone. This means that we're going to have to find a way, or this hormone has to find a way to increase the calcium levels to get back to homeostatic levels. And so it's going to stimulate the osteoclasts to start digesting bone tissue. Clearly, that's going to release calcium into the bloodstream. But also, we're going to see that there are a couple of other locations that can help us um, reestablish homeo homeostatic levels. For one, our kidneys can participate. And when our kidneys are in the process of making urine, first, Yes, they're going to try to remove waste products from our blood, including lots of water, and that, of course, forms urine. But during that process, and you will see this in AMP2, the kidneys are not initially perfect. In other words, they tend to remove a lot more than the waste products. They tend to remove some of the good things, and at times... Um, we're going to need to see that the kidneys need to reabsorb these good things. One of those good things might be calcium. You know, depending on what the calcium levels are in the blood, it might be that the kidneys need to go, oh, wait, 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 we need to fix the calcium levels in the blood. So all of this calcium that we were going to make part of the urine, well, let's take some of that back. Let's return some of that back into the blood. And that's called reabsorption. So the kidneys play a role in reestablishing calcium levels uh, when calcium levels have been dropping. And then also we can see that calcium absorption in the small intestine can increase. And don't forget, we're going to need vitamin D to help out with that. Without vitamin D, we cannot really absorb calcium from our small intestine. But with the help of these osteoclasts, the kidneys, the small intestine, we can ultimately rise our blood levels of calcium in the blood and we go back to homeostatic levels. So that is the function of the parathyroid hormone that is released by the parathyroid glands. Parathyroid hormone, often abbreviated as PTH. So its function is to increase the calcium levels in the blood. Calcitonin is going to typically work when your calcium levels are too high in the blood. So when the calcium levels are too high, we're going to now go in this direction. 
your thyroid gland is going to secrete the other hormone called calcitonin. It's going to inhibit the osteoclast activity and possibly kind of stimulate osteoblasts to start making more uh, bone tissue. That would be a way to remove calcium levels. But also we can, we can prevent the kidneys from reabsorbing calcium too much. Uh, that's easily regulated, as you'll see later on. And that's going to allow for a, a drop in calcium levels. I presume that we could also, uh, you know, uh, somehow the small intestine could possibly also be triggered to not reabsorb quite as much calcium. It might not be as, as easy to regulate that. So calcitonin, to summarize, is secreted by your thyroid gland and it's going to function in lowering our blood calcium levels when they have gotten too high. So I hope that I have convinced you now that our bone tissue is very, very dynamic throughout our lives. Actually, from the moment that ossification begins, bone tissue is very dynamic all the way into adulthood, pretty much until the day we die, our bone, is being our bone tissue is being deposited and resorbed um, all the time. And if we want to look at some numbers, notice that we recycle about more than 5% of our bone mass every single week, with our spongy bone being replaced uh, much more often than our compact bone. And we can replace whole heads of big bones like the femur, for instance. Now, as we get older, bone homeostasis becomes more challenging, which is the case for pretty much any organ systems. And we see, therefore, that our bones become much more brittle and therefore fractures are much more common. And don't forget, bone homeostasis consists of bone remodeling, which is going to automatically include bone repair, obviously. So earlier, when we began our discussion of bone remodeling in particular, I mentioned we need to have a good diet in order to maintain our bone tissue. And so let's take a look at that. The obvious ingredients that we need in our diet are the, the ingredients that are, will allow us to build those hydroxyapatite, so calcium and phosphorus, but even uh, the other minerals, you know, let's say that we don't, we, we can't forget that we also need minerals in our bone tissue, and, such as sodium and potassium and magnesium, and there's, there's several more, but calcium and phosphorus uh, in particular. Remember, phosphorus is the name of the element. Um, we eventually con convert this uh, to form hydroxyapatites into an ion, which we call phosphate. We need vitamin C in order to build collagen proteins. If a person has a vitamin C deficiency, which we do not see happen very often, but back in the old days when sailors were at sea for many, many weeks, if not months, and they ran out of their citrus fruits, they would start to suffer from scurvy, which is where they would lose collagen fibers to the point that they'd lose their teeth out of their jaws because your teeth are anchored with collagen fibers. Their skin would suffer because collagen fibers are in the skin and their bones would have major problems as well. Talking about collagen fibers, they're made up of protein and therefore we need to ingest the right amino acids to build those pro collagen proteins. Also, we probably should add that we need amino acids for not just the collagen proteins, but also for some enzymes, particularly in this case, alkaline phosphatase, which is that enzyme that we really need in order to allow for mineralization to occur. Enzymes are proteins. And then let's not forget vitamin D. Clearly, vitamin D is not a protein. Um, I accidentally indented that. It should not be indented, so let's pull it out like this. The bullet should be right here. Vitamin D is a steroid-based vitamin, and we need it to absorb calcium from our small intestine. So let's quickly refresh our memory what it means to absorb calcium in the small intestine. So let's say that this here... This is going to be a very sketch, 
sketchy diagram, but let's say that this here represents our small intestine with its wall here. And this is its lumen. I'm going to make a thick wall so I can draw it correctly. In the lumen of the small intestine now, we have um, food particles that are digested enough to the level that they could cross the wall of the small intestine. I just realized I should have actually drawn this more like so. Sorry about that. And so the wall of the small intestine, recall, is made up of simple columnar epithelial cells. Again, like I said, this is very sketchy and a little messy, but I think I'll get my point across. And the simple columnar epithelial cells sit on connective tissue that is vascularized. So I'm going to show you that with these little squiggles. This is our connective tissue. And then we have, beyond that, even some more muscle tissue and nervous tissue here, okay? And of course, the wall of the small intestine is not straight like that. It's very convoluted with villi, but this is just to get a point across. So when absorption occurs of nutrient particles, they are literally going to have to cross and let me enlarge this a little bit so you see this better. They're going to have to cross through these epithelial cells and then they will make it into the connective tissue. And so in the connective tissue here, we have blood vessels, tiny little blood vessels, through which these nutrients, through the wall, they can, the nutrients can diffuse through the walls of those blood vessels and reach the blood. And so this is what we mean by absorption of nutrients, or in this case, the absorption of calcium into the small intestine. Literally, or not into the small intestine, but in the small intestine. It literally means that calcium ions leave the gut, cross the simple columnar epithelial tissue, make it into the connective tissue where there are blood vessels, and there you go, the calcium has made it into the blood. And to stress one more time, this whole process of calcium reabsorption or absorption that we just described cannot occur without the help of vitamin D. So you can eat all the calcium you want, have all the calcium you want present in the small intestine. If there isn't enough vitamin D present in your body, that calcium is just going to get excreted more than likely. Clearly, vitamin D plays a very important role in bone homeostasis. So let's say a few words about it. You might recall from studying the integumentary system that with the help of the sunlight, our skin cells can actually begin the process of vitamin D synthesis. Recall that almost, or I should say, recall that cholesterol is always present in the cell membranes of our cells. The main, pro the main uh, molecules that you find in the cell membrane, remember, are phospholipids as well as proteins. Remember to form that phospholipid bilayer. But here and there, mixed in between these two main, pro uh, main molecules, we also have cholesterol. Well, in the case of the skin cell, when the sunlight hits the cholesterol, it starts to begin the process of vitamin D synthesis. Finalization of vitamin D synthesis doesn't truly occur until we make it to the liver, or I should say, until the molecules that are beginning to be formed by the skin cell make it to the liver, but especially the kidneys. The kidneys create a form of vitamin D. Um, you might have heard it called calcitriol. Not that I really need for you to know that term, but the really usable form of vitamin D for us to uh, more effectively absorb calcium is going to be formed at the level of the kidneys. 
We spent quite a bit of time earlier talking about parathyroid hormone and calcitonin and its role in maintaining calcium levels in the blood pretty much throughout life. Um, but we must definitely also mention the estrogens in the body. And when we take a look at this graph where we see bone mass here on the y-axis and then the person's age on the x-axis, it's clear that whether we're male or female, as we age, we start to lose bone mass. And in both situations, males and females, that is due to the loss of estrogens. Both males and females produce estrogens. Clearly, we females produce a lot more estrogen throughout life, but both genders produce estrogens, and those estrogens begin to drop as we get older. These estrogens play a very important role as well in maintaining bone density. Um, they somehow interact especially with the osteoblasts, and we're not going to go into those details um, except for mentioning that estrogens tend to prevent apoptosis of the osteoblasts. And if they prevent that, that means that the osteoblasts tend to stick around. So without going into the details of how that all works, I, wanna, I would like for you to recognize that there comes a certain age when females start to lose bone mass much more rapidly than males. And of course, this is due to menopause. And just a quick explanation of what exactly menopause is. Well, when we are young females, you know, between the time that we hit puberty and then when we start to go into menopause, we still go through our ovulations, indicating that we have plenty of eggs <clears throat> still available in the body that could potentially be fertilized, <clears throat> right? Well, it's these eggs that are responsible for producing estrogen. And we're born with many, 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 many eggs. And they sit around for our whole lifetime. And of course, therefore, they, through our, throughout our lifetime, start to possibly die off. Many of them become less healthy, which is why when we get older, it becomes more dangerous to uh, get pregnant with a child. But clearly, eventually, we run out of these eggs. And that's why we also start to see a drop in estrogen followed by a quick drop in bone mass. And of course, this also therefore explains why females tend to be more prone to fractures because they begin to suffer more easily from osteoporosis. And so be sure that you read the little section in your book on osteoporosis. In the disease called osteoporosis, literally meaning osteobone porous, so porous bones, we see that the pace at which bone reabsorption is occurring is out, is, is, is higher, I should say, than bone deposits. So those osteoclasts are much more active than the osteoblasts. And our spongy bone, particularly in our vertebrae, is very susceptible and this is why you very often see older people more hunched over um, like so uh, and express kyphosis of the spine more pronounced in postmenopausal women for reasons i explained just a moment ago the dropping levels of um, estrogen and it can get so severe, the osteoporosis, that just a, a, a hard sneeze or stepping off a curb the wrong way can result in the breaking of bones. Here we see a nice view of what a nice healthy trabecula looks like in spongy bone tissue. See the width of it, while the width of it is definitely less wide or less in the case of the person with osteoporosis. So read the section in your book on osteoporosis to become a little bit more aware of this condition. And so this wraps up the skeletal system. 
We've talked about ossification in the embryo. We've talked about bone growth in children, bone remodeling in adults. And prior to that, we were introduced to the anatomy of bones all the way to the microscopic level.